Okay, everyone, we're, uh, we're going to get started with our afternoon presentations. I am uh, Matt Dern. If you guys haven't met me yet, come on back to the Tenable table. I'm doing double duty with Higher Ground and, and Tenable back there in Higher Ground. Um, I'm pleased to introduce, I, sort of pleased, quasi. Somebody left me for another job uh, that I hired, and another person is just better than me at, at his job than I am at my job, so a little, little bitter. Um, but uh, uh, Brian Sheridan and uh, Ashley Bush are going to talk to us today about rating the recruiter. I'll let them kind of give you the, the precursor, but I want them to give the, a little bit of background on themselves. So we're all, you know, all right. on the same boat, right? What's under that one? You don't want to know. <laughs> that's, that's too much drinking, right? But um, we're going to talk about rating the recruiter. Uh, great resource to know who it is that's sending you emails and calling you on your work line and maybe they found your mobile number too. Um, try to find out who the right person is to talk to to help you out with your career. So I'm going to turn it over to Ashley and Brian. Yeah. Good afternoon everyone. Um, so we'll do a quick introduction and then uh, we'll get into things. Um, so my name is Ashley Bush, and I am a university and employment brand recruiter uh, with Tenable. So I focus on our internship program um, as well as our employer branding. But before coming to Tenable, uh, I have a, a bit of a mix of a background. So I did agency recruitment for a while where I worked as a third party recruiter for companies um, doing technical recruitment. And then I moved into in-house corporate recruitment and we'll get into the difference. Um, some of you may know what the difference is, some of you may not. Um, but I now do in-house recruitment for Tenable. Um, so that's kind of the background and we're gonna talk about the mix and, and how to identify recruiters in your network. But I'll let Brian introduce himself before we get started. Hello, uh, I'm Brian Sheridan, I've recruited with Tenable as well. Uh, I've been there for a little bit over two years. I've done agency recruiting before that as well. Uh, you know, I handle a number of different roles from some of your back office stuff, you know, accounting, finance, operations, but also sales engineering, um, you know, actually some international roles as well. So kind of a mix of things. Um, what we're really hoping to take you through today is identifying a recruiter that you can work with, whether it's in-house, whether it's agency, basically finding a resource for you to use and how to find out if that person is actually a valuable resource and worth your time. Because you're the ones with the skill sets, you're the ones with the good qualities that people are looking for, and searching for a job isn't usually fun. So you can kind of leverage some of these people, and these are some red flags to kind of look out for, or actually, I guess, green flags in some scenarios of, of who might be worth your time. Um, so I guess just kind of starting out, who has worked with, I mean, like an agency recruiter before, who has had a great experience? All right, that's a lot better than I expected. That's a whole, all right, we're off to a good start. Uh, I was gonna say, so with this, I mean, if it had been all great for everybody all the time, might not be the most valuable presentation for us to share. But uh, we'll go through some of these things that um, you'll see, the interactions you'll have. So that was kind of, what we just did was a little bit of why us, but again, taking you through some of the things that we see, some of the things that we try to do, um, because we know there is a bad rap out there for recruiters. Um, there's a lot more people saying bad things than you're getting glowing reviews, so um, we wanted to go through a bit of this. Sure, so a show of hands, is there anyone that doesn't know the difference between an agency recruiter and a corporate recruiter? Okay, so a couple. Um, so there are a couple different types of recruiters out there, um, and the reason that you know we're up here today is because Brian and I have been both of those recruiters. Um, so an agency recruiter works as a third party. Um, so essentially they work with companies and the companies are their customers. So you, they don't have um, necessarily the, the first direct contact or the first connection with a hiring manager. So they work as a customer and that agency gets a requirement or an open position from, say, Tenable. We say, we have an opening that we'd like to fill, we're having a hard time filling it, can you help us? Which doesn't help happen with us, because we're great. But um, So basically, uh, that person will get the requirement and then they have a team of recruiters that work on that position. So when you get contacted and someone says, I have an opportunity that's a great fit for you, but they don't really tell you too much about it, more than likely they are a third party recruiter and agency recruiter. Um, however, an in-house recruiter is someone who works directly for the company, which is what we do at Tenable. So they are in-house, they work for Tenable, and Brian can, can elaborate a little bit on yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, we're dedicated to the company specifically. I think one of the things you'll see that hopefully this is useful for you, uh, especially when looking at the agency side of things, um, 
it can be a volume business at times. So you want to find the person that can actually cut through that, knows what they're talking about. When I started on the agency side, I was doing accounting and finance. I do not have a degree in either. I did not work in that area. Um, I got better at it and I learned it, but what made me good at what? I was doing. That's kind of some of the things we want to take you through uh, from that perspective. So you can rate that recruiter and again, make sure that the job search process is worth your time um, and can be valuable to you in the future. It's, it's a relationship that might not have immediate returns, but your career is going to be long. You're going to have a, a couple different moves throughout your career. These are the type of people that can be a resource for you, uh, whether it's in-house with a place like Tenable or on the agency side. All right, so a show of hands, how many people have received, a, whether it's an email or a LinkedIn in mail that says, I have an opportunity that would be a great fit for you? Well, yep. <laughs> that was to say, um, how, many, how many people got four messages within an hour after a presentation earlier? <laughs> like, so, okay, you now have four people that want to work for you. How are we going to identify whether or not you should work with any of them or all of them and if it's a valuable resource? So, I mean, it all starts with an in-mail, right? Um, or an email, rather. So uh, I think the first red flag, ultimately, um, to, to weed out the, the good recruiters from the bad ones is, are they telling you what the job is? Do you know what opp the opportunity is? Did they tell you why it's going to be a great fit for you? Um, a, a phrase I like to use is buzzword bingo. Are they just pulling keywords from your LinkedIn profile or pulling keywords from your resume. Yeah, I see a lot of uh, head nods out there. You know, I, I constantly see emails, oh, um, we have an opportunity. I see that you, you have experience with JavaScript. Maybe you listed it one time in a project that you used in college. Um, huge red flag there. So uh, that's one way to kind of start off with identifying maybe not the best in-mail. They should be focused on you. Um, it should be customized. Yeah, you want to see, one of the things that I always, I've seen is like if you use your middle initial on LinkedIn and the message goes like, Dear Brian P, like that is a mass mail. That is not going, like if you have, um, you know, like if your name is, yeah, if your name is like William and it says like Bill, parentheses William, and the message comes out to that person like that, that person's just sending out as many messages as possible. Especially with some of the careers that you're, you're in and the paths you're taking, there's gonna be specific things that you're qualified for and you wanna do. You wanna to try to avoid just these mass messages. That's like a red flag to start out with. Not the end of the world. Um, you may wanna do a little bit of research if it somewhat relates to you, but you wanna see someone that's taking the time that will go through and find out specifically why are they reaching out to you? What is the point? Um, are they mentioning skills that you have? Are they offering something that you even wanna discuss? Um, you know, I've started conversations with people where I may have made a mistake and put something a little bit different with what they were looking for, but it was obviously a thought out message where we were like, well, no, I'm actually looking for this, not what you mentioned. Oh, I have that type of opportunity. Let's discuss it a little bit further. So you want to make sure that the person is specifically targeting you and actually has an opportunity for you. Um, if that opportunity is not real, it might not be worth your time yet. If that person has been in the industry for 15 years and has a lot of connections, it might be good to talk to them anyway, even if it's not a specific opportunity. That stuff we'll get into a little bit more as we go through. But um, definitely look for more substance rather than fluff in some of these messages where it's, I have an exciting opportunity with a high growth, dynamic, cutting edge company. Great well, company I have culture. no idea what they do. Yeah. <laughs> like I have no idea what they do. Um, but if someone can add a little bit more to that, go for it. Does the recruiter know what they're talking about? Um, I have a perfect example of this, and it was actually a huge fail on my part. Um, so when I started recruiting, I was doing technical recruitment, and I was looking for a Java developer. I did not know that the, there was a difference between a JavaScript developer and a Java developer. And so I reached out for the wrong one, and this person was this candidate completely chewed me apart, um, but it was, I respected it, and he explained to me that I didn't know the difference, but the point is the recruiter should know what they're talking about. The recruiter should have somewhat of an understanding of the role of the industry that they're trying to recruit you for. So they should be knowledgeable enough to at least know the difference, um, know the technologies you're working with. If it looks like they just, again, copied and pasted some technologies from your resume or your profile, it's a huge red flag. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't think you should have the expectation in all scenarios that a recruiter is going to know ex as much as you do. Like, you do the role. I do not know as much about, say, like, the sales profession as 
a sales professional that's in it. But I know what the company needs and I can discuss that a little bit further. And then we have other professionals that have been in those roles that can further evaluate that person down the line. So it's a matter of knowing what skills are needed to be successful in the role. And again, am I wasting your time by bringing these things up? Um, so again, you want to make sure that the person has a general idea. I think there was a picture going around that I thought was absolutely hysterical. If it was the, the Pokemon programmer, has anyone seen it recently? It's a person that he rates recruiters. He's got about 20 different languages in his profile. Several of them are different Pokemon. And he asks the recruiter to pick out which one are, are I guess, Pokemon, Pokemons. Um, pick them out. And if the person can't, then obviously they don't know what the different languages are. So I don't know if you need to test everybody like that. But if the person is telling you that, hey, you have a great background. I, I see that you have skills within FIP. And they're talking about PHP they probably don't know what they're talking about. So again, making sure that they have a grasp of what they're actually looking for so you can determine whether or not you want to invest your time. Yeah. And there we go. There we go. Um, so another red flag that's in, uh, you know, you might get from an email or an email, an initial contact from a recruiter. Um, immediately asking for referrals. That goes back to being a customizable message to you. If a recruiter is saying, hey, you know, I have a great fit for you, but if you're not interested, can you let me know three other people that you think might be a good fit for the role? How interested were they really in you specifically. Um, so it's a red flag and you know sometimes recruiters do build relationships with their candidates and they get to the point where you know they get to know you and they realize maybe you're overqualified, maybe you're underqualified, but they build the relationship and then they end up maybe saying hey do you know anyone that maybe might be a fit for this role? Totally different, but asking for referrals off the bat is normally um, a red flag. Something that we know coming from an agency background is often when people ask for referrals they're asking for leads for new business. Um, so they may not necessarily be asking for someone for the role, they're asking so they can get new business from another company. Yeah, I had a previous employer that used to ask for nine references if you wanted to be represented by them. Three subordinates, three peers, three managers. It was to find nine more people that they could represent. Like that was the purpose of it. Um, so that's something for down the line. Obviously it builds your credibility and can make you a more marketable candidate, but not something immediately off the bat that you generally want to get into. Uh, I know my wife actually ran into the same scenario where someone tried to recruit her and she was like, I seem really overqualified for this. I was like, uh, I'm underqualified for this. I was like, take, take the interview. If they ask for references by the end of it, is your manager qualified for it? She's like, yeah, this would be perfect for my manager. Like, that's why they're talking to you. They now have your manager's name. Um, so just something to keep in mind if that's the first thing. That's something that should come up in the process, but if it's, I have this opportunity and you know, if you're not interested, tell me who could be. Like, probably not someone that's really interested in representing you and your specific skill set. It's also the best way to mass mail. You know, in the agency that are coming from the agency, you know, you do very deep in the terms. You don't have to worry about being that person who doesn't understand that particular technology and that way you get a mass mail. Same thing right off the bat. Do you know anyone that might be interested in working in this role? And not even asking you. And the, the flip side of that is that sometimes you can build relationships with agencies through that initial outreach. Absolutely. Yeah, it shouldn't be. There should be a couple things you look at. Like, it shouldn't just be like, oh, this happened, like, done. You know, if you go in, uh, one of the slides we'll get into is if you go and look into the message and it's like someone has been doing this for 15 years and is connected with all of the people at the companies you want to be at, you're probably, gonna, that's, you know, that's a green flag. You should talk to that person even if they are sending out, you know, mass mail. Re recruiting, part of it's volume. I mean, it's something that has to happen, but how much technique is going into that volume is something that you want to pay attention to because that's someone that's really trying to represent their craft well the same way that you want to represent your craft and your skills well. It's someone that's taking the time to invest in that. All right, so getting into rating the mail, we kind of already talked about this. Um, but again, subject line I think is a huge start. I mean, you know, did they take the time to mention something other than this is a great opportunity? Or did they mention something other than great company with flexible work hours and work life balance? What about it do you, what, what about it is interesting to you? Um, why this company? I, you know, I took one of Brian's in mails as an example. Um, he talks about what the role is. He talks about people they'd be working with, um, you know, not to toot Brian's horn, but just an example of taking the time to craft a message that is catered to one person specifically. So you should feel like when you receive a message from that person that it is for you specifically. 
Yeah, and I mean, I think that's some of the things that you need to look for just in general within your, your career too, is the person trying to buy, provide something more than line items on a, on a job description. You know, what else is in it for you to make you want to do this job at XYZ company or ABC company? Um, that's something that you want to look towards. But um, this is a little bit edited, so we didn't totally blow up someone's spot on who I was sending messages to. But you want to see, you know, what are the skills that make this worth your time? I'm sure you're all high, highly qualified at what you do. There's got to be a really good reason for you want to make that jump to another organization. And these are some of the things that we're trying to find. Quick question. Just sure. 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 Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I always want to get into that with people up front. Like, what do you, it's, it's, you know, I look at it as in the way I kind of pitch it with my company is, you know, these are the things that you may have to do, but this isn't what will, you're doing those things and doing them well could make you successful, but here's how success is defined. You know, it should be tasks that you need to do. What's the first thing that you're going to come in and do? Like, how am I reviewed on this role? Like, I'll use, I mean... Sales, one of the things you have to do, you have to talk to customers. Well, I could talk to customers all day. If I don't sell them anything, I'm not successful in my job. But telling that person, you know, here's the, here's the, the quota that you're going to have to hit for the role, that's how you're successful. I mean, if you're someone that's, you know, a, a security, security analyst, you know, if you're able to lower the number of vulnerabilities or reduce the time to remediate those vulnerabilities, like those are the things that I want to share with you so you know, like, oh, okay, that's what I'm getting into. It also gives you perspective if I'm like, yeah, it's a hot mess in here. Like, do I want to keep having that conversation? Like, is it worth my move here? It could be. It could be exactly what you want to get into. Absolutely. Absolutely. I totally agree, but it's, you got to make sure that that's what's going to be offered. You might come in and go, yeah, we're really secure. You know, it's kind of a slow pace. I mean, you may bang your head against the wall for having nothing to do. So, yeah, I mean, I think that a recruiter should really go into that because it gives you more than a couple bullets on a job description. It's the big picture. Like, you could read a job description all day long. If I'm not sharing this information, like, why even talk to me? If I'm just regurgitating what's on paper, that's kind of another red flag where it's like, Oh, like even have the job description open, and if I just start repeating the things, it's like, thanks, but no thanks. Yeah, but let me add something. So from the job description, I'm Steve Lee, I'm the recruiter currently. Uh, and I was made here for 15 years, but I thought that was a lot of fun. So the problem with the job descriptions, as both every company on the planet and the universe has, they're not recruiting documents. They don't tell you what specific problem you're going to be solving. First couple of days, weeks, months of job down the line. Uh, they're, they're strictly done to help, to help identify what the, what the compensation is. The question that we want to ask and the recruiter should be giving you is what are the specific problems that are keys to hire a manager away from them? Mm -hmm. Now, your hire manager in recruiting is both every year, your plus one. The plus two is your manager and manager. And they all have deliverables. Absolutely. So focusing on performance rather than tasks. You know, if the job description says you're going to provide information to you know, security for the entire organization, well, no shit. That's what the job title of the job is. Of course, it would be doing that. What am I going to actually do to deliver? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll even, like, I mean, shamelessly plug Tenable a little bit. I talk about everybody doing work that matters. It's a slogan we have do work that matters. 
it has nothing to do with the bullet, well, it has somewhat to do with the bullets on a job description, but it's how are you contributing to the company success? What is the, and like that's something that someone's gotta be able to address for you. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's gonna be different for every job. And you, sh you know, I should be able to address that because then how am I able to actually determine if you're worth the next conversation? The next conversation is if you can address those things, if you've had past success doing it, if you can explain it to me, then absolutely. Like that's definitely something that you wanna find out and we should be able to address in our jobs. One of the things you can do is you can ask whether the interviewer or the hiring manager, draw me a picture of your architecture, of your system here, and put an X where your, your, your most pressing vulnerability Draw a picture, and you can also provide them with a similar type thing. This is where I'm coming from. This, these are the X, these are the hot spots that I've been looking on. You know, it's an accurate thing. So view it as a as a chance to brag a little bit. You know, brag with pictures. Absolutely. Not just words. Absolutely. All right, um, so a recruiter should be able to, to be a little bit creative when it comes to their craft. Um, recruiting is just like any other role. You should be able to do it efficiently and effectively. Are they speaking your language? Do they try to get into your world, um, especially for recruitment or technical roles? Are they going to meetups? Are they getting involved with your industry? Have they reached out to you on other outlets besides LinkedIn? How many of you are active on LinkedIn? Okay, so a good amount. How many of you are active on other outlets besides LinkedIn much more often, I'm sure? Okay, um, so I, I mean a lot of times recruiters will take the approach going to GitHub, maybe if they're looking for a developer, going on Reddit if they're active on Reddit. Um, so they should be able to think outside of the box and not just go directly to an in-mail. While most recruiters are active on LinkedIn, they should be taking the time to learn a little bit more about your world as opposed to just inviting you into theirs, so to speak. So getting into the LinkedIn profile, um, I really like my memes, as you can tell. Uh, so rating the LinkedIn profile, um, say you find somebody that they took the time to write you a really great in-mail. You're like, okay, I'm interested. Let's learn more about the recruiter. Um, some things to set a recruiter apart. Most recruiters are active on LinkedIn, so they should have a really strong LinkedIn profile. Um, I think if they have a bare profile, they're probably not the best recruiter. Um, but one thing to look for is tenure. Have they been with their company for a long time? Um, do they have experience with that company? That means that they know the company culture. They understand what the environment is like. Um, when it comes to being an agency recruiter, have they been with that company for a long time? If they've job hopped from agency to agency, maybe their performance wasn't that great. Um, so there are a couple things to look for when it comes to tenure. Uh, Brian, can talk about specializations? Yeah, and I mean, you want to look at people that can understand what, what you're doing. I think a really good example of the specialization is we worked with a third-party recruiter who was one of the more productive ones that we worked with. Person had only been in recruiting for a short period of time, but they were held the jobs that they were recruiting for for their career. They knew exactly what they were looking for. They were a hiring manager at their company. So that was a really valuable resource. Didn't necessarily have the, you know, the recruiting tenure for me to be like, oh, this is an industry pro. The guy got results and his team got results because they knew exactly what they were looking for. They had held those positions. Now, in some of the roles that you hold now, might not be the most natural transition to go with the recruiting route. Um, you might hate it, um, but if you have somebody that you know spent some time, got a degree within information technology, is um, you know getting different certifications within certain security fields. You know those are things that go a long way, and the person starts to understand better what they're looking for. That's the person that can go and have intelligent conversations with a hiring manager and go, look, I have a guy or I have a woman who can do X, Y, and Z that I'm working with, and that person's actively looking for jobs for you and finding those positions that might be a real fit for your skill set because they actually know your skill set. So again, opposite is when I started with an accounting and finance recruiting. I didn't have a degree in it. Um, I wasn't a specialist, but I did the high volume and was able to get results out of it. Um, you want to look at what their skill sets are and how it relates to what you need. Um, you know, years of experience can definitely be an indicator, but not the end of it. Again, if it's somebody just got into it, we have a person with about one year of experience in recruiting, but 25 years of recruiting, uh, 25 years of sales experience that became a really good resource for us. So you can take that with a little bit of a grain of salt, but you want to know, I saw the opposite. You know, company claiming to be experts. The person had worked there for one month. They had done recruiting for one month and were like out of school. They weren't an expert. Um, you know, you want to take a look at those things. It might be a red flag. 
Um, another thing to look for is quality connections. Um, take a couple minutes to look at the bottom of their LinkedIn profile, who they're connected to. Are they more connected to people um, within their industry? Are they connected to other recruiters? Or are they more likely to be connected to other people in InfoSec um, or security? That's also something to look for. If they're, their connections are you know, more in the industry that they're recruiting for, they might be a little bit more qualified. They might have um, a better idea of what they're looking for when it comes to recruiting for that role. Uh, what types of content are they sharing? Are they sharing pictures of their dog and how it was their dog's birthday last week? Are they sharing content that's related to your industry? Are they sharing content that's related to career advice or resume tips? Those are all th also things to look for. Again, if they take passion in their craft and what they do, um, they're probably a good recruiter. So, yeah, those are some of the things we kind of went through within that, that portion of it as well. Um, you know, how are they expanding on their skills? I mean, you know, what you can find is their resume and their credibility, so. All right, so we'll quickly go over, you know, you have a good email or an email from somebody, you think, hey, I'd like to talk to this recruiter about a role. Um, how do they handle that initial call with you? The first thing, it, it should be all or mostly about you. So while a recruiter does want to fill a position and find the great person for the role, they should want to get to know you. They should want to get to know your skill set. What are you looking for? I know in my initial calls with candidates, I don't want to just fill a position. I want to make sure that they're going to be happy in the position or I'm not doing my job because that person should get into the role, they should know what they're doing, and it should be what they want to do. If not, I'm doing an injustice by just trying to fill a position. This is one of those scenarios, too, with that first conversation where it may be a little bit different from the in-house recruiter versus the agency recruiter. An agency recruiter is going to actively market your background and try and get it out there. They will learn a lot about you and try and put you in targeted roles that make sense for your skill set. So it's going to be a lot of information gathering off the bat from that type of person. They may not actually have a company to discuss some of those details with. So it will be focused on you. Whereas if it's an in-house recruiter, I, like, I have a specific opportunity that I'm trying to fill. I should be able to uh, elaborate a lot more on what we're doing as well. Um, so just a little difference that you might see. So it might not be a red flag depending on who you're talking to uh, or how that conversation goes. And that also ties into um, them staying connected even when you aren't interested. This is more for agency recruiters. So maybe they speak to you and the role isn't a necessarily a fit for you. Um, they should keep in contact. A good recruiter will keep you in mind and reach out to you if maybe you're looking for something that's more hands-on and they initially called you for a management position. Maybe they should call you back. They should call you back and say, hey, maybe I, I have a position that's not a management role. Um, they should, again, keep in touch. If they're, they're really interested in you and they're doing their job um, well, they're going to reach out to you about other opportunities that might be a fit for you. Um, so we have like two minutes left. Yeah. So um, figured at this point we're not all the way through, but would rather answer any questions that you may have about this process. Again, it's something we go through every day, um, something that hopefully you want to go through by choice. Um, would really be the goal. So is there anything kind of within this that we can help with? Oh. So with, with the two types of recruiters, <laughs> what drives a recruiter to make the investment and to represent us versus we're just a commodity volume item? I mean, there's going to be a number of things about it. I think the person that does invest and doesn't treat you like a commodity is the person that you want to work with. So like, that's a scenario that you shouldn't really run into if you're working with the right people because, I mean, it, it's what they do for a living. Uh, they help people find jobs. They make companies grow. Um, you know, that's, that's something that you want to look for that someone's going to identify. When you get the person that's just kind of churning and burning and volume, you know, again, they might not be the best resource for someone that's kind of more sophisticated within their career. Um, you know, when you got to throw as much of it at the wall as you can and it's got to stick, that might be the type of person that you do want to work with because you just need that volume. But when you're strategically looking for jobs, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's someone that takes their craft seriously is, is really the biggest thing that's going to differentiate it. Doing some of this research is what helps you identify that. Um, it's not something that's just going to be like, you know, on my profile, Brian treats people really well. Like, no, I have to earn that. And that's part of the follow-up, staying in touch. Am I actually reading what's in your profile and making sense of why I'm talking to you? And one other thing on that is a lot of times if they're in the space you're in and they're recruiting in the space you're in, they're going to know some of the same people that you may know coming here. So how many people do mm -hmm. they know that you know? Or at least that you 
I've heard of. So that's just legitimacy validation that they're doing what they're doing. They're talking to the right people. They probably know somewhat what they're talking about. So check that out too. Yeah. Easy way is if you share a connection, just kind of reach out to them. You know, does this guy just connect with every person out there, or you know, what do you think of Matt? You know, he likes gummy bears from his profile, Dude, like so he wrote that in code. Anything else? All right. A couple last minute takeaways. Anything? Did you want to say, say anything else? Thanks for listening. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right.